Hi, everybody. Welcome to Understanding Canine Body Language Part 2. Thanks, everybody, for joining tonight. Um, remember, this series is in two parts. You certainly can take them out of order, um, but tonight we're going to be talking about primarily fear, reactivity, and aggression, and how that relates to your dog and other dogs that you might come in contact with. So um, my name is Angela Lenz, and I own Tails of Wagging Doggy Daycare and Canine Training Center here in Bellingham, Washington, and I'm so happy that you're here. So let's go ahead and get started. Again, we will take a break um, halfway through, get some water, stretch our legs. And so if you have any questions, um, certainly send them to chat and then we'll pause in, in, this, in the middle of the presentation and then at the end to answer any questions that you have. I am more than happy to answer anything that you have. So let's go ahead and move on. Anna, I'm having a little bit of trouble here. I'm on my way, hold on. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> oh, technical difficulties, everyone. All right, so tonight uh, we're gonna be talking about understanding our canine companions. Specifically, we're gonna be talking about appeasing and avoiding behaviors, right? We're gonna be talking about the fact that our dogs will do just about everything they possibly can to prevent something bad from happening. So we're going to talk about what that physically looks like in our dogs. We're going to talk about stress. We're going to talk about anxiety, how that shows up in our dogs. We're going to talk about something called a calming signal. Calming signal, we're going to get into that really, really deep tonight, but a calming signal is a physical behavior that your dog does to express low levels of stress um, and the and them trying to relieve their own stress as well as asking others how um, to kind of bounce that information off of someone else. We're gonna talk about fear. We're gonna talk about why dogs have fear, um, how it um, shows up on their body. And then we're gonna talk about bite inhibition. Um, we're gonna talk about bite levels. Uh, we're gonna talk about reactivity and aggression in dogs and where that comes from. And then once you have all of this amazing information, we're gonna talk about a plan of action. What, when you, when you have any of these behaviors in your dog, if you're noticing any of these issues with your dog or dogs in your life that you happen to see in the world, how, how do you deal with that, right? What should you be doing? How can you help those dogs feel better, right? That's the whole point is to help our dogs with their confidence, help our dogs understand that you are not something to be feared, not something to, that they should be, be feeling upset about. We're, our goal here is to help them with their communication skills with each other as well as with people, right? So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, so remember when, uh, if you didn't uh, come to part one, we're going to recap a couple of things tonight. So remember how dogs communicate. Remember that they're going to use different body language to piece together different words, right? So imagine that you put together different words to form a sentence, but those words might, um, change depending on how you spelled them or how you paired them with other words. So that can change their meaning a little bit. And that's the same for dogs, right? So different movements might be paired with other movements and that can create different meaning. So we have to look at the whole dog or the whole sentence really to understand what they're trying to communicate. So understanding that not all words or not all body movements have the same meaning is really important for dogs because we want to understand intent, right? Intent is really important with dogs. What they did is exactly what they intended to do. So that's important to understand with their movement so that we can look at that tip of the nose to the tip of the tail so we understand the full um, impact of their statement, right? Full impact of that whole sentence of what they're trying to communicate with us. So remember that we're gonna be looking at the points of interest with our dogs. We're gonna be looking at, of course, the tip of the nose to the tip of the, tip of the tail. So in the head, we're gonna look at the mouth. Is it open? Is it closed? We're gonna look at those ears. Are they forward? Are they back? We're gonna look at the eyes. Are they open? Are they closed? Are they blinking? We're gonna look at the brow. Is it flat? Is it furrowed? We're gonna look at the spine. Is it flat? Is it um, 
Oh, is the weight evenly distributed over the dog? We're gonna look at that tail. We're gonna look at placement of the tail, movement and structure. We're gonna look at the legs. Are they super stiff or are they bent slightly? Primarily, we're gonna be focused on the front, um, but overall, we're gonna be looking at that whole physical dog, right? The tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. I want you to really start to look at that whole picture. So remember what we learned in part one, right? We're gonna recap that real quickly. When we look at this dog, we can just look at this golden retriever and say, well, gosh, that's a nice dog, right? But how do we know that that's a, right, that's a nice dog, right? So we're gonna remember what we learned in part one. What do we see from that tip of the nose to the tip of the tail? So remember we learned in part one that that open mouth and exposed tongue is gonna mean that what that dog is looking at, they enjoy what they're looking at. Right, they enjoy that whatever they're they're visually experiencing, they're enjoying that, and they'd like more of it. Please, um, noticing that tongue is starting to come past that teeth. When that tongue, the further out it comes, that lets us know how stimulated. The further out it is, the more overstimulated that brain is. We can see those eyes are open, those eyes are alert. We can start to notice that that brow is starting to furrow. So when we, the more furrowed of that brow, the more stimulation that we're starting to see, it's not completely flat, it's not completely relaxed. So we can see that, see that with that furrowing, he's starting to become more on alert. We can see that those ears are starting to come forward. Oh, he's a little bit more on alert, but his weight is evenly distributed. He's feeling pretty comfortable there. His back is nice and flat. That tail is in a fairly relaxed position, but we can tell that it's starting to come up just a little bit. So all of those tell me that this is a dog that's enjoying what he's looking at, but he's also pretty excited about what he's looking at and it's getting pretty um, on alert about what he's looking at. Happens to be, I think, a squirrel that, he, that he's looking at in this picture here. So moving on, let's get right into appeasing and avoidance behaviors. So dogs will do everything that they possibly can to share, hey, I am feeling really uncomfortable. I don't like how I'm feeling. I would really like some help. I would really like to know if I am being threatened. I would really like to know if, frankly, are you here to eat me? Is this, is this what's happening? So they'll begin to do these appearing, appeasing and avoidance behaviors often when they're in a situation that they're feeling uncomfortable, just when they're starting to feel uncomfortable. So some of those are sniffing the ground, often for no apparent reason whatsoever, right? You'll be walking your dog and all of a sudden they see another dog and boom, they just start sniffing the ground. Um, we, they'll start to, they, where they originally had an open mouth and an exposed tongue, they'll close their mouth. Right? When the dog goes from an open mouth to a closed mouth, that means, hmm, I'm going to need to make a decision here. It might be good, might be bad, but I'm not quite sure how I feel about it. They'll also start to have a curved body. So the, you can see the chihuahua in the center and the little terrier mix. Both of those dogs are a little bit beyond just appeasing and avoidance. Those dogs are, are really starting to push that spectrum. They're also showing other behaviors that we're going to look at a little bit later. That paw lift starting to, to show uh, the chihuahua in the middle is also starting to show something called a whale eye, where you can see more of the white part of the eye than any other um, part. Also notice that, they're, that the ears are back and that back is starting to curve. When you see that C curve, think caution, right? That dog is definitely concerned about what they're looking at. Um, and then the little terrier, you can see off to the side there, he's looking down, he's avoiding eye contact, he's curving his body language, he's tucking his tail, trying to make himself a little bit smaller, definitely trying to avoid this situation altogether. Other appeasing and avoidance behaviors is scratching the body. This is a really common one at the veterinary hospital or the groomer um, walking into a place where they generally don't always have happy feelings, right? We want our dogs to love going to the veterinarian. We want our dogs to love going to see their groomer, but that isn't always the case, right? They don't always have the most enjoyable um, visits, right? If the only time you went to the doctor was to get poked and prodded, you wouldn't necessarily like going either. So. Make sure that you're working with a veterinarian that um, 
has happy visits, right? Make sure that you're working with a groomer that has pop visits where you can just work with them and pop in and get a cookie and you can um, go into your veterinary hospital and walk in and stand on the scale and get a treat. Um, if you're not already using a, a fear-free veterinary hospital or a fear-free groomer, certainly look them up because that would be an individual or an organization that has taken that extra step to learn about this information, right? Remember, they don't teach this kind of stuff in veterinary school. This is something that a veterinarian needs to access on their own. And so, um, seeking out a fear-free veterinary hospital would be something that you would you would definitely want to seek out for for your own dog. So scratching the body um, is a real common one, right? Um, dogs obviously scratch because they're itchy. They might scratch for allergies, but when they're not typically an itchy dog, and then all of a sudden they just start scratching, this can certainly be an appeasing and an avoidance behavior. Next, we're looking at the paw lift. The paw lift is really common. So I want you to notice all of these pictures. First, let's take a look at these little Great Pyrenees puppies in the upper left-hand corner. These puppies are four weeks old. The, this, all of these behaviors, these are not learned behaviors. These are instinctual responses. And so these puppies are already offering this behavior at just four weeks of age. So what's happening here is they're lifting up that paw. When you see that paw lift, think to yourself, my, my dog is asking a question. And that question is, are you here to hurt me? Is, am, I, am I in trouble, right? Somebody let me know because I'm feeling real sketch vibes right now, feeling really uncomfortable and I need to know. The little chihuahua, little brown chihuahua on the bottom here, the reason that he's turning his head to the side, which is a calming signal that we'll talk about in a second, but that paw lift is simply because the camera is facing him, right? That's all. The camera has a big um, open lens, right? That looks like a big eyeball. So that's often why dogs will turn away from the camera because it looks like a big eyeball coming towards them. Remember, our dogs are animals, and so they're going to respond instinctually to those types of things. So in the other video or in the other pictures here, you can see that paw lift. In, you can also see other signals as well. We can see furrowed brow, we can see ears back, we can see lifting of the lips, we can see closed mouths, we can see all of those things that generally we put together. Remember, we're looking at that tip of the nose to the tip of the tail to be able to say, okay, that dog is definitely trying to convey to the other dog, I am feeling really uncomfortable and I'd like a little help. I'd like to know that you're not here to harm me, okay? We see these behaviors um, in relationship to us because these are natural behaviors for our dogs to do when they're feeling uncomfortable. So we'll see these behaviors uh, when they're at the veterinary hospital or at their groomer or um, we're doing something that's making our dogs feel uncomfortable with touching them in a way that they didn't give consent to or we're brushing them in a certain way or we're cleaning their ears or we're putting drops in their eyes so that they're, they're saying, hey, gosh, this is really making me feel uncomfortable. So we're going to talk about tonight how to help them through that process, right? We're going to talk about how to have this cooperative care with our dogs, but also what happens when you're in a situation where, oh my gosh, my dog's feeling really uncomfortable, but I'm in a situation that I got to get through. What, what is it that I do in that situation? We're going to talk about that tonight. So let's look at a video about what these kind of appeasing behaviors look like in real time. And with my videos, we're going to watch them, we're going to talk about them, and then we're going to watch them again. Now remember with um, my videos, I often, well, well, all of them really, um, are taken at our doggy daycare or in our training classes. And so they are usually taken by my staff. And so they're holding the camera and they're watching dogs. So um, be mindful that um, they might be a little wobbly. So um, thanks for your patience understanding that. Hello, Lacey. Okay, so let's talk about what we 
just saw. Let's talk about it and then we'll watch it again and I'll narrate it um, as we watch it again. So first we had um, the dog that was in the pen area. We opened up that gate and then you could immediately see how the dogs started to greet each other. Did you notice how it was they started to circle each other just a little bit um, and they were sniffing each other. They were um, the little brown and white dog, the little terrier mix was the one that I want you to really pay attention to. She was offering lots of appeasement and avoidance behaviors and the little beagle was starting to reflect those. And then all of a sudden here comes the little Yorkie just kind of flying on in there, not really paying attention to anybody's needs. And because that Yorkie was just kind of ran in and took over and ran like a straight shot right towards the uh, terrier mix, which in the dog world, when one dog runs straight towards another dog, it's considered really, really rude. Um, a straight line for one dog towards another is, um, it's kind of like uh, running up and chest bumping somebody when you greet them for the first time. So it's definitely a rude behavior. We don't want our dogs to do that. Um, so if you are a person that allows your dog to just rush up to somebody while you're going, that's okay, he's friendly. Um, no, that's not okay. So please stop doing that. We'll talk about more uh, about that tonight, but um, it's not, a, it's not okay. Um, they might be friendly, but they're not, it's not a very social behavior. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. But um, so when that Yorkie kind of runs up and is rude, you'll notice that the terrier really starts to offer those appeasement behaviors. She starts to really curve her back. She starts to flick her tongue. She starts to lower her head. And, um, and then when she starts to kind of come out of it a little bit, she starts to gain her composure. Um, and then the other dogs kind of approach a little bit. So let's Let's watch that again, but I'll narrate it through. So there she is. Her eyes are up. Her tail is up. She's interested in coming out. She greets that beagle. Very respectful. Notice how they're kind of curving their heads towards each other. Very respectful of each other. There's that curve. Very nice and respectful. Oh, there's that rude Yorkie just comes flying in there. There's that curve. There's that paw lift. The beagle still trying to, to put herself in position there, saying, it's okay, I, I got you. The terrier's trying to remove herself from that situation to say, oh gosh, this is really making me feel uncomfortable. I, I better kind of remove myself here um, because I, I don't really like how this Yorkie is approaching me. So let's move on here. So let's get into talking about calming signals. So what happens if you offer someone an appeasing or an avoidance behavior and it is met with continuation, right? What if someone, what if you say to someone, oh gosh, I'm feeling uh, a little bit uneasy and I'm offering you this appeasing behavior. I'm offering you this avoidance behavior. I, I'm really asking you if you are here to hurt me and you keep coming. Right, just like that Yorkie. What if what if you just keep coming? You're not listening. You're not paying attention to what I'm um, the signals that I'm giving you. What if you just keep coming? It's going to move up that ladder to something called a calming signal. A calming signal is just that next step where that dog says, "Okay." I've tried to avoid this situation, but that didn't work. So now I'm going to let you know that I'm really feeling it. Now I'm really starting to feel uncomfortable here. A calming signal is um, where that dog is, is just kind of think, think of these behaviors like a ladder. Think of it like, um, you've all heard that term uh, where, where someone says, oh my gosh, that dog bit and nobody saw it coming. Yes, we all saw it coming. You just didn't know what you were looking for. So tonight we're talking about all of those things that you need to look for. So a calming signal, specifically yawning. Our dogs will yawn upon rising, just like you and I do. But when they yawn in the presence of a trigger or an exposure, it's something that's stressing them out, that's a calming signal. Our dogs will lick their lips. They will flick their tongue often in the direction of the thing that's stressing them out. They will look away. They will um, turn their head to the side. They will turn their whole body to the side, offering their shoulder. They will move slower. Um, this is a real common one when you're walking your dog, normal, normal gait, right? You're just walking along and then all of a sudden your dog really slows their, their speed. 
um, they will go from an open mouth to a closed mouth, right? Remember, that is that question of, oh gosh, I'm not sure how I feel about this. Or they will stiffen their body, they will stiffen their tail. So that yawn looks just like we would expect a yawn to look. It will often be in conjunction with closing their eyes or blinking their eyes. Um, when a dog yawns, it looks just like you or I were yawn and just like a dog would yawn when they're rising. We will often be able to see their full mouth, we'll be able to see their full tongue, and we'll often be um, curling that tongue at the end. We call that a spatula tongue. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but when we get that little curve at the end, that's a sign of stress. Here's that tongue flick. Um, in all of these pictures, the dog is flicking at in the direction of the stressor. Um, if that's off to the side, um, if that stressor is directly in front of them, um, or again, off to the side again. Here we have some lookaways. Um, in the upper corner, we can see a, um, several calming signals happening um, with, in conjunction with some appeasing behaviors. So we've got the look away, right? That's number one. We've got a closed mouth, which is an appeasing behavior. We've got a whale eye, which we're gonna learn about a little bit later, where we can see a lot of that white part of the eye. Those ears are back, that brow is furrowed. And what's it about? It's that baby, right? It doesn't like that baby. Um, it's, not, it's not to say that that dog um, has Ill, Ill will towards that baby, but it's uncomfortable, right? She, she doesn't want to be in that situation right now. And so she's trying to say, um, I'd really like to not be here. I'm sure that they're um, seated for a portrait. So being in a new situation and having a camera pointed at them, um, isn't helping the situation either. In that center video, um, let's look at what we're looking at here. We have a person that's hugging their dog. I am here to tell you dogs do not like to be hugged. Um, it is certainly something that we can condition our dogs to enjoy. We can condition our dogs to enjoy just about anything if we take the time to provide cooperative care and to um, help our dogs enjoy the process. For sure, we can help our dogs learn to do that, but just going up and hugging a dog, that's not something that dogs like. Why don't they like it, right? We like it, we like to hug our dogs because we love our dogs, but why don't dogs like to be hugged? Because what, do, what does a predator do right before you eat it? You loom over it right before you eat it. So remember, our dogs are animals, and so instinctually, that's they're going to be feel, feeling overwhelmed. They don't like hands reaching over their head. They don't like their heads being wrapped with arms. They don't like being encompassed. Um, so be mindful of that. Be mindful of how you're approaching a dog. Are you approaching in the way that you want to approach, or are you approaching in a way that the dog likes to receive? So in that middle picture, yes, his mouth is open, but notice his lips. Notice that his lips are pursed on the side. Do you see all those wrinkles that are starting to happen? Then we notice that his brow is furrowed, his ears are back, he's looking away, that tongue is, is starting to curl. So all of that is exhibiting, oh gosh, mom, this is stressing me out. I don't like it. Please stop doing it. And then in that bottom picture, these two guys are playing a little bit, but then it gets to be a little much for the brown dog, right? The little white terrier is um, getting a little overstimulated. We can see that he's overstimulated because of those over-exaggerated facial features, but the brown dog is definitely doing that look away. Um, his ears are back, his brow is starting to get, is furrowing. And so we can definitely know that he's expressing, dude, take it down a notch. I'm getting a little stressed out here. I'm, I'm not feeling it. I need you to, to dial it back. So let's take a look at what those calming signals look like in action. Again, we're going to um, watch the video. We're going to talk about it and then we're going to watch it again. And um, thanks for understanding that our videos are taken um, at daycare. <laughs>
She has a really good girl jersey. I know. That's a very good girl. That's a very good girl. And the okay, come on. Okay, so, <laughs> so we're going to watch that again, and I will narrate it through. But we've got three dogs in that video. So we've got a Landseer, we, which is the black and white Newfoundland. We've got the Doberman Nix, and then we've got the Goofball uh, Black Lab. So when I when we watch it again, I want you to pay attention to several things. There's so much going on in that video. So the first thing I want you to notice is the is how the Doberman mix, how she shakes her whole body. Um, the shake off, we're going to talk about it a little bit later um, in a little bit more detail. But the shake off is the is when a dog releases endorphins, right? That's the equivalent to Woo, that was stressful, right? So they're just releasing that, um, that energy. They're releasing those endorphins. That's not always a bad thing. Sometimes our dogs will do that when they're, when they're excited about something, they're happy about something, but they're definitely releasing that energy. So um, after that happens, you'll notice that she immediately starts to, um, that lab kind of gets really goofy and starts to kind of get in her face and licks her all around. Um, and then she, her body goes stiff, her tail stops moving, she closes her mouth, she turns her head to the side. She definitely is saying, look, just chill out. You're, you're a little too much to the table, puppy. Just dial it down a little bit. But notice he's not paying attention at all all. She's about two, three years old in this video. He's five and a half months. And so he is not paying attention. He is in his own little happy lab land. Um, and he, he's, he's not paying attention, right? He's not paying attention to her. He's just thinking about his own self, which is typical for a puppy, typical for a boy, typical for a lab that's just in his own little happy self. And so um, that's why um, you, can, you can hear the staff rewarding her, right? Definitely, we want to reward our dogs for offering these signals. It's absolutely right for them to express their feelings. Our dogs have the right to share their emotional state. It's always a, an appropriate thing for them to share their words, for sure. So we're going to watch that again, and let's um, talk it through. So there's that shake-off behavior. She licks her tongue, and then he's just kind of licking her over. He's super wiggly, and she just stops moving. There she turns her head to the side, her tail's not stops moving, her ears go back. That's a really good girl, Jersey. Like, what? I, I'm not I listening know. to you at all. That's a very good girl. Everything that you're feeling, it's it's totally fine for you to express how you're feeling. We never want to shut down how our dogs are feeling. All right, let's take a then we're gonna talk about it a little bit. We'll watch it again. <laughs> Thank you, Daisy. Good girl. Thank you, Daisy. Good. Thank you, baby girl. Thank you, Daisy. Thank you, Walter. Good boy. Walter, Walter, here. Thank you, Walter. Walter, sit. Good boy, Walter. Good boy. Okay, go play. Thank you, Daisy. Good girl. Yes, Walter, good. That's nice. Thank you, Walter. Walter, Walter, here. Sophie, good girl. That's nice, Sophie, good. Good. Thank you, Daisy. Good girl. That's much better, Walter. Good, Walter. Good job. Thank you, Daisy. Treat for you. Good girl. 
Thank you, Walter. Much better. Oh, that's much better. Thank you, Sophie. Good job. Thank you, Finley. Thank you, Finley. That's nice, puppies. Very good. Good job, puppies. That's nice. Good. Good job. Job, Finley. Thanks, Daisy. Good girl. Treat for you. Good. Thank you, Fritz. Good boy. Thank you, Fritz. Sophie, Walter, come away. Sophie, Sophie here. Sophie. Thank you, Fritz. Thank you, little bear. Thank you, Fritz. Little bear, little bear here. Okay. So obviously for the purpose of our seminar, we let this go on way longer than we typically would in our group play setting. But um, let's watch this again and we're gonna talk about what we are looking at. So in that beginning uh, video, we are looking at Sophie and Walter. They are two five month old um, pit bull puppies. So I want you to notice how their first greeting, how they just run right up, like that straight shot right into the yellow lab. And uh, remember how we talked about that straight shot is always super rude, right? We don't want our dogs greeting another dog with that straight shot. So um, the, the reason again is that when one dog greets another dog direct like that, it's considered rude in the dog world. We want our dogs to greet organically in that kind of circle motion, right? Where they're kind of walking around each other. And we'll see that a little bit later, um, how the dogs improve with that behavior. So uh, um, what we were talking about was when our dogs are leashed, they know they're on leash, right? They know that when push comes to shove, they're kind of screwed, right? Our dogs have two options when they're feeling uncomfortable. They can fight or they can flight. And if they're restricted in their movement, guess what they have? They have fight. And so when we're asking our dogs to greet another dog when they're on leash, it's inevitable that it's gonna go wrong. So if dog trainers could rule the world, we would say no leash greetings ever. Right? It's totally fine to never allow that to happen. My dog, um, she's 15 years old. She's probably the most social dog you're ever going to meet. I still don't have her meet another dog on leash, even though she's super friendly, super social. She knows absolutely how to greet everybody always appropriately. I still wouldn't put her in that situation. It's not a fair thing to ask her to do. So you have my permission to just say no and to just keep moving on. Now, I'm certainly an advocate for play dates. I'm certainly an advocate for having dogs meet up and getting together and, um, you know, playing with each other. Absolutely. Off leash in a safe setting. For sure. Let's do that. But leashed greetings, not, not fun, not fair. So you can see here in these videos how those dogs just kind of ran straight up to each other. Um, that has to do with something called neutrality. When we talk about socialization in these young dogs, a lot of times people think that socialization means you got to love the people and you got to love the dogs. And that's not it. Socialization means we, yeah, we want you to love people and we want you to love dogs and we want you to love men and women and kids on bikes and clowns and balloons and lawnmowers. We want you to love all of that stuff but we want you to do it while you're calm and relaxed. That, and that doesn't mean you get to greet everybody, right? That's not what being social means. It means being able to read the room. It means knowing that 
not every situation is a kegger, right? You don't get to just run up and greet everybody. Sometimes it's a wine tasting. Sometimes you're at a tea party and you have to be able to adjust your behavior accordingly. That's true socialization. So make sure that you're teaching your dog that kind of socialization, not just woohoo party time every, every time you get to see somebody. So these dogs, that was that situation where they were just kind of let to greet everybody, um, you know, haphazardly. So then they met Daisy. Daisy did something called a maternal correction. A maternal correction is, uh, let's watch it here. It's when um, our dogs will um, give a verbal correction to an older dog to give a verbal correction. So here, notice how they just ran right up to her, kind of jumped in her face, and say, excuse me. Thank you, Daisy. Good girl. They did it again, so there's a correction. Remember, correction Thank you, verbal. Daisy. There's no contact with the correction. Good. They backed off. I'm the Thank you, her. baby girl. And there she does it again. They offer those calming signals in response to that. So Thank I you, Walter. Good them. boy. Walter. He starts to Walter, bark at her, so I Thank you, Walter. Him Walter, sit. Good boy, Walter. Good boy. Okay, go play. She's still not feeling super Thank you, comfortable. Daisy. You can see good her girl. Tail's a little stiff. Her mouth yes, is Walter. Good. That's nice. They start to get Thank rude you. again, so she gives them another maternal uh, uh, correction. Uh, uh, so, if the Walter. Walter here. Puppies don't automatically leave. I ask them. Sophie. To leave. Good There's girl. There's that lift. That's nice, Sophie. Good. Now they're good. being much more responsive. Thank you, girl. That's much so better, Walter. Good, are a little Walter, bit more curvy. Good job. They're not just rushing after her face. Thank you, Daisy. Treat for you. Good girl. Thank you, Walter. Much better. Oh, that's much better. Thank you, Sophie. Now here's good another job. dog. They're, they got right Thank back you, to being Finley. rude again. His approach, you, he's young That's as well. nice, so his approach puppies. Is a little bit different. He just kind of Very moves good. around. But look at this organic. Good job, thing. puppies. See how they're moving That's around. Nice. What if they were on leash? Everybody good. would be facing each other, and that wouldn't good go job. well. So they're sniffing each other's butts. That's just a nice little handshake with each other. Chuck Finley. Thanks, Daisy. There's those good girl. abusing avoidance behaviors of just Trick sniffing the ground. Now, this is a Good. different yellow lab. This is Fritz. He's a Thank young you, adolescent male. So he's going to be a lot more tolerant than Daisy was because he's a young Good boy. Good boy. So he puts up with a lot more than she ever would. So typical Australian. Thank you, Never Fritz. Runs over to be a sheriff. Sophie, Walter, come away. Sophie! And they're Sophie, getting a little pushy, so Sophie. now he finally says, Thank you, Okay, now I've had enough. He gives them a little bear. maternal correction right there. There's another one. Thank you, Fred. And they bear. don't immediately bear here. recall, so I recall them away. When our, when our dogs give a maternal correction like that, I immediately want you to reward your dog. When your dog says, rah, 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 right? What they're doing is they're saying, hey, mind your P's and Q's, little one. Remember, it's, it's an adult dog's job to help out our puppies, but it shouldn't be their only job, right? If you have an adult dog and you brought a puppy into your house, trust me, your adult dog did not choose that. Your adult dog was so happy to just have you. And so you, it's important to understand that you don't have a full-time babysitter there, right? It's not their full-time job to take care of your puppy. So, so it's great that they're there to help, but it's also important that you reward them handsomely for their jobs, right? So when they do give that maternal correction, reward them. Good job. You did so well. Treat, 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 and then remove that puppy. They need to know, thank you so much for, for giving that, that puppy a nice verbal correction and not harming that puppy in the process, and then remove that puppy. The puppy's not going to get in trouble when they get removed, but have a Kong ready to go, waiting that in the fridge, walk them to their crate, 
give them a, a, a timeout, give them a, a, you know, time to just chill, give them a minute so that your adult dog knows, yes, gosh, that I did the right thing. I don't have to take it too far. I don't have to put my mouth on them. I don't have to do that. So if you have an adult dog that is taking things too far, that's because chances are you are reprimanding your maternal corrections. If your dog is verbally reprimanding a young dog and you're saying, hey, cut it out. Hey, stop doing that. You're not saying, hey, don't do that behavior. Because remember, maternal corrections are normal and natural. Our dogs are supposed to do it. If you're, if you're trying to shut that down, what that dog hears is, hey, guess what? You suck at your job. You better do it better next time. So those corrections will get bigger and louder and more dramatic. So trust me, if you reward your maternal corrections, you will get less of them because like any sentient being on the planet, they will do the least amount of work for the greatest reward. So reward your corrections, your verbal corrections, and then remove the offender. You will have a much more calm situation, right? So here's that ladder that I was talking about, right? So we want to look at it like, um, like a ladder understanding that though that dog bites don't come out of nowhere, right? They never do. They always start as those appeasing behaviors, those displacement kinds of behaviors, and then they work up to calming signals. If those don't get the response that the dog is looking for, they're going to start to get into more stress reactions. Um, or our dogs might start panting, their pupils are going to dilate, they're going to start showing those whale eyes where we start to see more of the white part of the, of the eye, their hackles might start coming up, remember that's the sign of overstimulation where the fur is coming up on their back. If that's not getting the response that they're looking for, that's when we get into um, where they'll freeze and they'll close their mouth and they'll stop offering those calming signals. That's when I start to worry. When they start to learn, okay, none of this is working. I'm not going to waste my energy anymore. And I'm going to go right to growling, right to biting. I'm going to go right to it. That's when I start to get concerned. So it's important that we start to pay attention to all of those mild signals so our dogs understand, yeah, that works. If I see you in this stressful situation, I'm going to rectify that. I'm going to get you the heck out of that situation if I can. And if I can't, I'm going to help you through it. And I'm going to I'm going to help you tonight understand how to do that. Oops. Oh, yeah, that was right. All right. So how do we help a stressed dog? So you might ask yourself, well, if I saw that my dog was stressed out, of course I'd get him out of that situation, right? Of course I would. Well, what if you can't? I understand that if you are in a situation that you can control, right? If you're walking your dog and here comes another dog and your dog starts offering these behaviors, these appeasing behaviors, these avoidance behaviors, these calming signals, absolutely get your dog the heck out of there. Turn and leave. Don't try to walk your dog, you know, get your dog through it, go. If you can get out of a situation, get out. Your dog, I want your dog to look to you as a touchstone. I want your dog to look to you as your, you are your, their advocate. When, when everything hits the fan, they should look to you. That's what I want for sure. But there's going to be situations that that can't happen, right? You might be in a situation, your dog is sick. They have to go to the veterinary hospital. Your dog is at the groomer. They've got a mat and they, it has to get clipped out, right? They have to use the clippers or, um, your dog needs medication and you have to apply it. Um, and you're in a situation where this has to happen. I, I certainly want you to work with a reward-based trainer to be able to, um, to help your dog not be stressed out about this. But in the moment, I want to help you be able to get through this. So how do we help a dog in the moment? How do we help our dog when they're actively in a stressful situation, right? Imagine you walk, uh, your dog is in the exam room at the veterinary hospital, that veterinarian walks in, that white coat, uh, oh my gosh, your dog takes one look at them, starts licking their lips, starts furrowing their brow, turns their head to the side, but you're here for vaccines, you got to get this done. What do you do? We're going to mimic the signal right back to the dog. So what the heck does that look like? So first thing we're going to do is talk about consent. So when we talk about um, consent in our dogs, 
Um, that's not something we talk about very much. Um, we talk about consent with people all the time, right? Consent for touching another person, consent for um, um, touching a child, right? Hugging them. But consent for touching a dog, that's not something that we talk about very much. We oftentimes somebody will ask you, hey, can I pet your dog? Um, but how many times do you ask your dog? Hey, can you, um, would you like to be touched? Would you like to be petted? So let's learn about asking your dog first if they want to be touched. And then we're gonna get into mimicking our signals back so that we understand um, helping our dogs through a stressful situation. So let's look at consent. So again, we're going to watch a video, we're gonna talk about it and we're gonna watch it again. Okay, so in this video, I did a method um, asking for consent. So what I did is I touched the dog um, on her side near her chest. That's a very safe place to reach for a dog. The reason I did that instead of reaching for their head or reaching over their body, remember reaching over a dog can be very stressful because of course, what does a predator do right before they eat them? They reach over them. So what I did is I reached out, I touched the dog and then I pulled my hand back and paused. If she wanted to be touched, she would have leaned into me. And we'll watch a video to see what that looks like. But notice that she did not lean into me. She offered calming signals. She said, uh-uh, lady, I don't like that at all. I, I, don't, I don't want you touching me. I don't want this to be happening. And then I touched again, right? I kind of pushed it a little bit more when I shouldn't have, but I, but I did it for the sake of the video. And then she continued to offer those signals to say, um, excuse me, I don't like that. I don't like you touching me. So let's look at the, that in action again. So there's that look away. There's that tongue flick. There she's looking away. I'm touching, touching, touching. And I stop. She looks away again. She's furrowing her brow. Her mouth is closed. She's blinking her eyes. All of those are saying, uh-uh, I don't like it. There she flicks her tongue. I move my hand back. She starts blinking her eyes. I touch her again. When, of course, I shouldn't be touching. She licks her, she flicks her tongue again. She blinks her eyes as to say, uh-uh, I don't like it. I don't, I don't want you touching me. So let's look at consent when a dog does want to be touched. So again, I reach on the side of the body and there she leans in, giving me consent, saying, yeah, absolutely, you can touch me. Keep going. I like it for sure. So it's important that we ask our dogs for consent. This is my dog. She's 15 years old. I ask her for consent every single time I touch her. Every single time. I think it's an important thing to do because I would want that for, I, I wouldn't want somebody to just run up and just start touching me, right? Um, it, it's something that I want to make sure that she understands that that's not something that's going to happen to her. I'm not just going to rush in and swoop her up off the floor. I'm going to always ask her, hey, is that okay with you? Is that okay that I do that to your body? The reason that I do that is so that when I do need to put her in a situation that she's not the most comfortable with, she's going to trust me. She's going to trust that I'm not going to push her beyond her limits. So by doing that, by always asking for consent, with our dogs, they're gonna trust us a lot more, right? They're gonna understand, okay, this person is paying attention to my feelings because they are a sentient being, their feelings are absolutely valid. So you'll notice that by leaning into that movement, that was her saying, yes, I, I like it, I, I keep going, I, I enjoy that process. So in this video, this is where we're gonna look at 
calming signals in a situation where you have to keep going, right? So imagine this situation. Um, this is my dog, Percy. He's since passed away, but um, Percy had never really enjoyed having his toenails trimmed. And so I purposefully took this video um, because I knew he didn't like it, um, because I wanted to show you um, those appeasing avoidance behaviors, moving into calming signals, and then what if I had to get through something? What if I, what if he was at the vet and we needed to get through a vaccine? What if we needed to do it? How can I help him know, hey, I got your back, right? I, I, I know that you're stressed out. I'm here to help you. Okay, so what we noticed here, I knew exactly how to push my dog. Um, and so um, you can see that I was just kind of, uh, you know, I was, I was facing him. I was pushing him a little bit. I was staring at him. I was grabbing his foot, which I knew he wouldn't like. Um, and I was kind of holding on to it and he was pulling back. He started to offer those signals, appeasement behaviors, looking away, licking his lips, started to do those calming signals. And then I pushed him over and then I started to loom in on him. I started to definitely, you could see how uncomfortable he was, right? Now that you know what to look for, you can see it. You can see that he's feeling uncomfortable he was definitely saying uh excuse me i really don't like this you are making me feel super uncomfortable um back the heck off lady um he started to give me that whale eye and his ears were going back and then he lifted his lip um and then he lifted his uh both of his uh, his muzzle on both sides and then my response knowing that i needed to be able to communicate to him I absolutely know exactly how you're feeling. I can see that you're stressed out. I know we still got to get through this. Was mimicking those calming signals back to him. I yawned at him. I licked my lips so that he knew, okay, she can tell that I'm totally stressed out. She's mimicking that signal back to me. Okay, she's at least hearing what I'm saying. That's what we're trying to um, to help you understand that by at least letting your dog know that you are at least on the same page, that helps dramatically. So let's look at that again while we narrate that. So there, I'm, he's blinking a little bit. He's like, oh, that's weird. What are you doing? He's trying to pull away a little bit, licking his lips, his ears are back. I push him over. He's got that whale eye, like, that. You're, you're being weird, lady. What is happening? His rear legs are stiff. His back is stiff, his ears are back, his back is curved, his mouth is closed, he's flicking his tongue. I start to, you know, go for his belly, he's licking his lips again. Oh, there goes those, those teeth up, or this, his lips up again. So I offer the, the, the yawn, I start licking my lips, he starts, he, there it is, and then he licks me as a piece. Then there's that polish again. So then we both kind of come together and understand, oh, okay, we're both on the same page again. Got it. So by doing that, it's not that your dog isn't going to be exhibiting stress. That's not, that's not the, in, the intention here. The intention here is to help your dog understand, I got you, all right? I know exactly how you're feeling. I'm here to help you get through this situation. If there's anybody that's going to be your advocate, it's going to be me. And then, of course, we would look at this whole situation and say, all right, going to the veterinarian, that freaks you out. Getting vaccines, touching you in this place, that freaks you out. Then you're going to reach out to a reward-based trainer, and we're going to set you on a counter-conditioning plan to be able to prevent them from being stressed out with that in the future, right? So we will put you on the track 
so that this behavior doesn't stress them out in the future. But in the here and the now, by mimicking those signals, you can help them get through it. So let's look at um, another video on how dogs do the same behavior with each other. Now, again, um, we took this video for the sake of this seminar. So we would um, typically never let this go on, obviously. Um, and um, authorization, of course, from both parties um, getting this video. Australian Shepherd is the one that's offering all of these appeasement and avoidance behaviors, um, all of the calming signals. The dog in the red coat is definitely completely overstimulated. Um, so that dog, you can hear her um, uh, kind of chatter her teeth a little bit, almost um, to the point of snapping. Um, she's not snapping at the dog. She's more kind of chattering her teeth, which is a, a sign of overstimulation. But she does it in direction towards the other dog, which is um, there could be all sorts of different reasons. In this case, it's overstimulation bordering a little bit of hurting. Um, but what's happening is the Australian Shepherd keeps trying to offer these calming signals, right? She keeps trying to say, um, I'm totally stressed out and I am not here to hurt you. Um, I, I want you to, I want you to hear that I am not something, you're stressing me out and I'm not here to hurt you. So she keeps offering them over and over and over again. So again, when they're, when a calming signal is not met with a mimic signal, um, the, that, that behavior will escalate. But when, when it is met with a mimic signal, it will de-escalate. All right, so we're going to talk, oops, go back. We were going to talk about that shake off one more time. We're going to watch this video a couple of times because it happens really fast. Um, so here we've got two puppies playing. Um, it's that Lancier again, that black and white Newfoundland, and then a husky puppy. Um, you'll notice that the husky puppy is wearing a harness and dragging a leash. Her recalls are not the greatest, and so it's not an uncommon practice for us to have a dog wear a harness um, and drag it around so that should we need to step on that heart, that leash, and then we could recall the dog um, while, while still staying safe with our collar um, during play. Um, so let's look at this. There's a couple of calming signals that happen as well as the shake off. Okay, so all of that was really fast, but lots of things were happening. So um, I'm going to, um, we're going to watch it again. I'm going to try to narrate it through. So here they're playing a little bit. Um, doesn't like that at all, so she lays down, shakes off that release of adrenaline, and the other dog flicks her tongue at her um, to mimic a signal back saying, oh, you released that adrenaline, let me flick my, mimic a signal back to you saying, I hear you, right? You were, you were releasing that, I'm going to mimic a signal back to you to let you know we're all on the same page. You were a little bit stressed out, I'm a little bit stressed out. Okay, let, let's, all, let's dial it back. So they were both in good communication there. But it started really because the Lancier um, was kind of grabbing the leg of the Husky, which um, with puppies, it's not um, an uncommon thing, but we don't want to encourage leg grabbing with dogs. Um, puppies will just simply do it because puppies just grab everything when they're playing. But we don't want to encourage that behavior because it's not appropriate for adult dogs to do. So of course, anything we don't want adult dogs to do, we don't want to encourage our puppies to do. So in this case, though, she kind of, they're playing and wrestling around a little bit. She grabs that leg, stresses the husky out a little bit. She um, 
uh, offers that signal and then uh, the Landseer shakes it off uh, to go, oh, okay, all right, that was a lot. Let me let me shake it off. The husky um, flicks her tongue a little bit, making sure they both understand they're both on the same page. <laughs> So you've got to be looking for this kind of stuff. So remember we talked about um, that ladder, right? I want you to, to always think about it as um, moving forward with those behaviors, right? Those When a dog bites, it's never going to come out of nowhere. It's always going to be those appeasement behaviors going into calming signals. And then it's going to show higher levels of stress then it's going to move into growling, then it's going to move into the lunging, then it's going to move into the biting. Um, let's talk for a minute about growling. I want you to think about growling as a gift. So many times we misunderstand the growl. I think it's probably the most misunderstood behavior of all the, of, of any behavior in dogs is the growl. The growl is the equivalent of a dog um, saying, oh my God, I am so scared. I am so terrified. Please help me. Do not make me bite you. But what is the most common thing that a person does when a dog growls? Tell them to shut up. Tell them to be quiet. We tell them to stop it. When you reprimand a dog for growling, that is like taking the batteries out of your smoke detector. That is bad news. Trust me, if your dog is afraid and so afraid that they think they're going to bite someone, I absolutely want to know about it. I absolutely want my dog to be able to express, I am so terrified right now, I'm about to lose it. Please get me the heck out of here. So when you're in a situation where a dog, if it's, if it's your dog, obviously if it's, if it's your dog and they are growling at a person, right? If they're outwardly growling towards someone um, that is coming into the yard or coming into the house or something like that, I want you to acknowledge it, right? Oh my gosh, thanks buddy, let's go. And then get them out of there right? Do not reprimand it. Do not tell them to be quiet. Do not tell them to stop doing it, but get them the heck out. Move them to a, a safe location, right? Whether that's a crate or a bedroom or a bathroom or just get them out of there. If your dog is growling at you, whatever it is that you're doing, stop doing it. If you are reaching towards them, if you are touching them, if you are whatever it is, stop. And then look at that situation and say, what is it, it, what is it that I'm doing that's causing my dog to feel this way, right? Because they're sentient, right? They're a sentient being. They have the right to say no. They have the right to their emotions. Just like you have the right to be able to say, uh-uh, I don't like this. Your dog has the right to say, uh-uh, I don't like this. Your dog shouldn't have to just tolerate something because you want them to tolerate it. If you need them to be able to tolerate a situation, you have to do the work. You have to do the work to be able to condition them to love and accept being handled and touched in that particular way. That's your job. You've got to be able to do that. You can't just make them do it and force them to do it and then be surprised when their emotions come to the surface that they're afraid. So if you are out and about and a dog uh, let's say you come around the corner and there's a dog, uh, not your dog, but a dog is there and growling at you. I want you to stop. I want you to lower your gaze. And then I want you to slowly just walk backwards, right? Don't try to yell away. You leave and retreat, but do it in a way that's less threatening to the dog, okay? Um, dogs are much more likely to bite when they're in a restrained situation, and we're going to see that much later, but um, so if a, if a dog is on a, is on a tie-out or on a leash, 
or behind a fence um, or in a car, um, they're, they're always much more likely to um, lunge towards someone if they're restricted in their movements. So always be really mindful of that. So we're talking about that gift of growling that I want you to, to really take note of that. The picture on the right and the picture on the left is the same emotional state. So many times we think that that growl means that the dog is trying to be tough, that trying that dog is trying to control a situation, that dog is trying to be the boss of a situation. You could not be further from the truth. That dog is terrified, right? Imagine a four-year-old child standing there so terrified that she's trembling. That's what's happening. You wouldn't reprimand a four-year-old child for crying, trembling, right? You wouldn't tell her to shut up and be quiet. You would try to try to get her out of a situation. You would try to stop whatever the scary thing is that's happening. I want you to think about that with growling. Growling is a gift. Thank goodness your dog is feels comfortable enough to be able to communicate that and not go into the next step. Because if you continue to reprimand your dog for growling, they absolutely will bite. If your dog is biting, that's why. That means that they've been communicating all of these skills all this time and somebody either hasn't been paying attention or they've been reprimanded for doing it. And that's why they're biting. So let's talk about the whale eye. That whale eye is something we've seen a little bit um, in some of the pictures before, but it's primarily when we see a lot of the white part of the eye when you see that, know that that's, that's a big, scary signal, right? That dog is just about to bite you. It's often a, a signal um, after the growl, but before that bite. So pay attention to it. Um, pay attention to when you can see the whites of that dog's eye. When we look at, um, when we have this kind of information about calming signals and about how dogs communicate, we can look at a picture like this and think it's cute, right? But now we know, we know what we're looking at now. We know that this dog is feeling so completely uncomfortable. We've got a curved body. We've got a whale eye, those ears are back, the brow is furrowed, the mouth is closed, the lips are tense, the legs are tight, right? The legs are stiff. That dog is feeling super uncomfortable. It's important that we, we understand that it's not just about observing and making sure that our that we're paying attention to our dogs and our children together right that's that's not just what it's about it's about making sure we know what we're looking for 77 percent of all dog bites happen with the family pet and the majority of those dog bites happen when the guardian is standing less than a foot away so it's not that parents it's not that you're not watching you just didn't know what you were looking for so when a dog trainer says, oh, you need to watch your dog and your kid better, screw that. You're already watching. You're already right there. You need to just know what you're looking for. And that's what we're doing tonight. I'm helping you understand what to look for. I need you to be your dog's advocate. I need you to be their voice. So another thing we're going to talk about tonight is trigger stacking. Trigger stacking is something that happens with every bean. Um, you, if, if there's anybody out there that, um, that has anxiety, you will understand this concept um, for sure. Trigger stacking is when enough is enough, right? When you have been, had so much going on um, in that particular day or that particular week or that particular moment where you have had enough, right? Um, one of the ways I explain it is, let's say you go to work and every day you get up and your alarm goes off and you get out of bed and your partner makes you coffee or makes you breakfast and you take a shower and then you drive to work and you, uh, uh, you know, you, you start your day and that's your work day, right? Now imagine that your alarm 
alarm didn't go off and your partner burnt your toast and they used up all the hot water and you had a cold shower and you were running late to work and you got a speeding ticket on your way to work and then you get to work and your boss is being a jerk. Same day, right? Same, all the same things, but your day is very different, right? That has to do with trigger stacking. It's additions to your environment that um, increase fear, anxiety, um, reactivity, um, that kind of stack onto each other. So it would be things in your dog's, your dog's life would be like, um, oh my gosh, I went, um, I had a, an episode with the neighbor cat today. And then um, I got spooked by um, um, a kid with a bike. And then I went to the groomer and then the mailman came by and oh my God, the, the neighbor reached over the fence and I snapped at him. And the neighbors reached over the fence a million times and I've never had a problem with it. That can be trigger stacking. So it's important to understand that those things are important to be mindful of, right? Just because your dog was okay one day doesn't mean that they're going to be okay another day. That's normal. That's how brains work. And we have to understand that because our dogs are sentient, they know of stealth, self, this is a normal process for our dogs. So we have to be aware of that. Don't just kind of lump your dog into your dog's always good. They're always going to be good, right? Your, your emotional state changes day to day. That's normal. It's normal for your dog too. All right. So in this video, it's a little bit long, so I'm going to um, narrate through the, the whole video. So this dog is in a shelter environment and, um, sweet, sweet dog, right? But the situation here is that the person taking the video is trying to engage the dog, trying to get the dog to engage with them, right? But they're doing it in a way that the person wants to engage, right? So she's kind of reaching in, she's talking to the dog, and the dog is trying to say, you're freaking me out, lady. It's too much. Not only am I stressed out being in a shelter environment, because that's not what I'm used to, but you're, you're staring at me and there's a camera in my face. And so lots of calming signals, licking lips and turning their head to the side. Um, there's that whale eye blinking, that curved back. You can see her kind of reaching in a little bit. Remember, of course, uh, tip of the nose to the tip of the tail. So, oh gosh, he's wagging his tail. He must love me. Well, he wants to love her, right? He wants to. It's not that he's not a friendly dog. He's just, he's scared. He's overwhelmed. This is too much. He wants to. Just because you want to do something doesn't mean that you're emotionally capable of doing it. So he's offering all of these signals to say, this is really stressful for me. It's, the, it's too much. I don't, I don't want it this way. I want it, but I don't want it this way. So there's a different way that we could have gone about this for this dog, right? Super, super friendly dog. That's, that's not really the issue. It's just that it's important to understand that as people, we often try to communicate to a dog the way we would want to be communicated with, right? We want someone to reach out to us. We want someone to touch our hands. We want someone to talk to us. We want someone to look into our eyes. That's not necessarily how a dog wants to communicate. So it's important to understand that, that we should be communicating the way the dog wants to communicate. So just continuing to see, she continues, uh, he continues to, there he kind of leans in a little bit. So um, he's certainly asking, saying, I, I give you permission to keep touching me, but it's super, it's stressing me out. It's a little uncomfortable, but I still like it. So it's okay to have this kind of mixed feeling, right? We have it, right? We have mixed feelings all the time. Um, in this next video, um, it gets a little loud. So I want to talk about it a little bit about what you're going to see. Um, there's nothing graphic or anything in this video, but um, this is um, a dog that's um, in, a, in a situation where they're um, in a country that 
um, uses dogs for food. And so this dog is being rescued, um, um, has been purchased from a rescue organization as, and is being removed, being brought to a different country um, so that he's not gonna be used for food. But you have to understand that he, this dog has probably seen all of his siblings um, being uh, used in a completely different situation, right? Not treated humanely at all. So not only has he seen horrific things, but he's probably been treated horrifically. But I want you to pay attention to not only the signals that, he, that he's offering, but notice how she's trying to communicate. She's trying to communicate in a way that she would want to be communicated with. And this is so common in uh, the pet care industry, right? We try to comfort dogs in a way that we would want to be comforted, right? We would want to be touched. We would want to be talked to. We would want to be looked at. We would want to be um, engaged. That's not how our dogs would be calmed down. And he doesn't get calmed down that way either. So we're gonna, so it does get pretty loud. So um, I'll narrate a little bit um, through it. So the arrows are pointing to all of the calming instead see that she just continues to touch him about his head. She's reaching over his head, touching his face. He continues to offer signal after signal after signal. Notice that his body is stiff, his starting to curve, his tail is tucked under. So when he's, when the dog stops vocalizing, it's not that he was feeling better, it, he was shutting down, shutting down completely, um, just completely giving up. So the reason I like to show this video is, again, the human is, is communicating in a way that the human fe is feels better, right? Not the way that the dog would feel better. Um, and also to communicate that this is not an American dog, right? This dog is a United States dog. So all dogs communicate in the same way, right? They all offer these signals, um, no matter where they're from, all across the world, all dogs communicate in the same fashion. They use these same kinds of signals to communicate these levels of stress. Okay, he, this video here is, um, this is Kendrick. He is, in this video, I think he's about 14 weeks old. Um, you will see that he's kind of in a corner. Um, the a veterinarian had called me um, because he was 14 weeks old and already um, had bitten the veterinarian. And so they um, wanted me to assess um, him and um, you know, where to go from here. I use a device that we sometimes still use, not very often, but it's called an assess a hand. Um, when, when a dog has a known bite history, we might use it a little bit. It's just an extended hand to keep um, evaluators a little bit safe. So you'll see that kind of extended out. So we're going to look for the calming signals, but I want you to notice how a little bit in reverse they are. So he's, number one, he's backed into a corner. Number two, um, his back is curved. Um, notice that he's growling, right? Um, he's, um, his tail is tucked, his mouth is closed, um, but, I'm, but, but I'm still coming, right? I'm still coming towards him. 
And he doesn't know that that arm kind of reaching isn't my arm, right? He's only 14 weeks old. His vision isn't the greatest. And so when I reach and kind of come in contact with him, he um, lunges and bites. And then afterwards, then he does multiple calming signals. In, in that order, when we kind of see it where it's kind of mixed up a little bit, where um, he's doing these avoidance appeasing behaviors and then growling and then biting and then calming signals, that usually comes from something called an alpha roll, which we know um, I, I knew after this situation had occurred, once I got a little bit more history from the owner, that that indeed had happened multiple times, not only with the owner, but with the veterinarian, unfortunately. So um, you may have heard of this training before, um, where a, a trainer, an old school trainer, an old corrective trainer might have said, oh, if your puppy is acting out, you need to show your puppies who's boss and you need to pick up your puppy and you need to flip them over and you need to show them who's boss, right? You can't let your puppy get away with that crap. Show them who's boss. Um, no, please never, ever do that. That is inappropriate. It is always wrong. That does not ever happen in nature. Dogs do not do that to each other. Please don't ever do it to a dog. That whole theory, that whole thought process came about in the 40s. Um, a group of scientists were studying wolves and what they thought they were seeing was um, adult male wolves. They thought they were seeing them flip puppies on their back. And so they said, oh gosh, those puppies must have been out of control. And those um, alpha wolves were trying to teach them who was the boss and they flipped them over and so dogs are wolves and so we um, we must do that to our dogs to show them who's boss. No, so not only are dogs not wolves, um, that's not what was happening. We know that now. Um, we know that what was really happening was something called role reversal, which is when a puppy voluntarily flops himself over in the presence of another. It is not a forceful move at all. It is not one dog pushing another dog over. When you watch part one, you will see role reversal um, as normal play, as normal interaction. Um, and so when you do that to a, to a dog, um, or puppy especially, you what you're essentially doing is you're telling a puppy you are something to be feared, you're something to be um, um, something that really shouldn't be trusted at all, and you can't trust what you what you fear. Um, you are erratic and you don't speak their language at all, and so absolutely your puppy's going to become reactive. They're being, going to become more bitey. They're going to become um, more suspicious and they're usually going to have issues with reactive behavior um, and bite inhibition. So if anybody has ever told you that, kick them to the curb and reach out to a reward-based trainer that uses science-based, modern methods, drug-friendly training. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's talk about bite inhibition. And bite levels. I think biting is probably my most favorite thing to talk about ever. So if you ever want to take me out to coffee, let's talk about that. Um, so let's talk about biting. Um, we do not expect dogs not to use their mouths. They are dogs, but we do expect them not to cause harm when they do. So in order for that to happen, we have to teach them bite inhibition. Bite inhibition is your dog's ability to know how hard is too hard, when is it okay, and when is it not okay to cause too much pressure with their mouth. So puppies learn bite inhibition between four weeks and about 35 weeks of age. They learn it as a puppy. We can't teach an adult dog bite inhibition. We can teach an adult dog um, how not to become overstimulated. And, and we can teach a dog to be gentle, but true bite inhibition as far as socialization only can happen with a young dog. So why do we need to teach bite inhibition? Because dogs rarely want to bite, right? They don't, if they bite, um, chances are they're going to be bit, right? So they wanna prevent that from happening as much as possible. Um, and they'll always, they're always gonna give all of those signals in order to prevent that from happening. Um, Knowing that aggression is always fear-based, 
Um, I've been a dog trainer for 29 years and maybe once in my entire career have I seen idiopathic aggression. Um, idiopathic meaning we don't know where it came from and even in that situation, I still think it was fear-based. I still disagreed with the other trainer, but uh, it's always going to be fear-based unless you're dealing with a medical issue, right? There certainly are metabolic and medical reasons for aggression. So if, if your dog is showing signs of um, fear, reactivity, or aggression, I'm always going to suggest that we start with a medical evaluation first, because there certainly are medical symptoms that look like um, aggression. So, okay, so let's talk about canine bite levels. The reason that we have to talk about bite levels is because if I say, oh, this dog bites, well, what the heck does that mean? Does that mean he air snapped at someone or he ate a small child, right? We have to be able to quantify that. We have to be able to know what that means. So we, we in the dog industry categorize them as six different levels. Level one is a pre-bite. This is a warning. This is um, often referred to as an air snap. There's no contact, but we definitely refer to it as a bite. If your dog is air snapping, you need to contact a trainer because it is definitely considered a bite. It needs to be treated for sure. Um, level two, still a warning, um, but there is contact, but there is no damage. Um, so they've made connection with the skin, but no damage to the skin, right? There's no damage done. There might be maybe a little red mark, but definitely no, uh, no damage to the skin. Level three, we break it down into two parts. We do a level A and a level B. Level A is there's a nick in the skin, but um, we definitely refer to it as a nick. Might even be two little marks, but um, clean it up a little bit, but you definitely don't need much medical attention. Um, level three B, however, it's definitely um, more punctures, right, more deep puncture, but it's not greater than half the length of the canine tooth that caused it. So now you know why it's really important for me to know who did that bite, right? I need to know, did a Chihuahua do it or a Rottweiler did it? That helps me know how deep that bite is. Level four, um, this is where it starts to get very serious, right? We start to get um, deep punctures, we start to get bruising um, because of so much pressure that has been applied. Um, level five, super serious. We will often get um, multiple, more than four holes where they bit, released, and bit again um, within a millisecond, right? Um, we'll start to get severe black bruising. Level six is death or consumption of flesh. So it's so important that we know exactly what we're talking about here. So 99% of all dog bites, level ones and level twos. But it is so important that you get help. If, you are, if your dog is experiencing a level one or a level two bite, you need to reach out to a reward based trainer because it's not uncommon for that to progress. If you do nothing, if you don't address why your dog is feeling the need to put their mouth on a person or another dog, it can progress. So we, we don't want it to progress to a three. We don't want it to progress to a four, but we need to address it for sure. So please don't just say, oh gosh, it was just an air snap. We're not gonna, it's not a big deal. No, it's a big deal. You need to reach out to a reward-based trainer in your area so that we can actively work with that. All right, let's take a look. We're uh, just like with all my videos, we're gonna watch this, talk about it and watch it again. Oh boy, I love where I paused that video. Okay, so this uh, was on live TV. This was a police dog um, that was um, being interviewed with the, the canine handler. Um, the gentleman that was interviewing the dog, um, you could see that he's crouched down. What, what I think was occurring is that he was kind of adjusting his weight. Like you could see that he was um, kind of crouched down and sitting on his 
um, knees, right? And so he just kind of happened to adjust his weight and ended up leaning in towards the dog. Um, he, I don't think his intention was to lean in towards the dog. But, but by doing so, um, he, the dog was offering all of these signals, right? I'm feeling uncomfortable, I'm feeling uncomfortable. And all of those signals were met with confrontation, right? Coming closer towards the stressor. So let's look at that again. And let's look at all of these calming signals, right? So he's touching him on the head. Tongue flick, tongue flick, tongue flick. Heads back, ears are back, whale eye. He leans forward. Dog lunges and bites. Remember, dogs are much more likely to bite if they're restrained. So not only is he on a leash, but he's physically in between the legs. He's physically in between these two people. That was a level two bite. No damage. No damage at all. Why? Because the dog knows bite inhibition. It's a police dog. He's certainly trained to know how much pressure to apply. Level two bite. Let's watch it again, because I know you love it. Look at all those calming signals. I'm feeling stressed, I'm feeling stressed. That's met with confrontation. As opposed to mimicking the signal or backing off. So the dog had, in his mind, no choice, right? I give you signal after signal after signal, you're not backing off. Well, clearly, I gotta, I gotta one up it, and I gotta bite you. This also occurred on live TV. Um, but I'm especially happy to meet you after your story yesterday. What? He's a mastiff, right? He's a Dogo Argentine. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, he's an Argentinian mastiff. Okay, yes. okay. You're gorgeous. You're gorgeous. Oh, I'm so glad you're okay. You too. Thank you, you too. Thank goodness for you. Yeah. Um, gosh, have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank Happy you. Valentine's Day. Oh. Oh, my God. Um, Barry? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. So okay. that situation um, was um, the dog was a stray dog that was, um, there was a frozen pond. The dog had fallen through the ice and the paramedics and fire department had rescued this dog and it was a big news story. And so they brought the dog on TV um, to, you know, talk about this heroic efforts of this dog. I mean, of this, of the paramedics and the firefighters. So here we've got a dog, um, super stressed out, right? On a stage, restrained, in between people's legs. Um, we've got um, a, we've got um, um, people holding his collar. Um, so anytime you have restriction of the collar, um, I never, I never like to restrict, I never like to use collars period, um, whether that's um, walking or, of course, never choke chains or pinch collars or anything like that, obviously. But when you restrict a dog's breath, um, it can create a panic response. So it will increase that reactive behavior. But he's offering calming signal after calming signal after calming signal. Um, you can see him tongue flicking, his ears are back, he's turning his head away, he's doing everything he could possibly do, and then she leans in and puts her mouth on him, right? What does a predator do right before they eat you? And so his response... I'm especially happy to meet you after your story yesterday. What, he's a master, right? He's a Dogo Argentine. Uh, oh, okay. So um, he's an Argentinian master. Okay, yes. okay. You're gorgeous. You're gorgeous. Oh, I'm so glad you're okay. You too. He's you trying too. to pull Thank away from her. He's trying to um, remove gosh, himself. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank happy you. Valentine's Day. Oh. Oh, my God. Um, Gary? Yeah. That was okay. a level five bite. Half of her chin and... Um, lower lip was removed. So it, it is so important that we understand bite levels because when we're talking about bite inhibition, we have to know that dogs need to be taught the force and frequency of their bite. It has to be something that we teach our dogs how to do when they're young because situations like this can happen right? It's inevitable that a dog might be in a situation 
I'm sure that the owner of this dog didn't necessarily think that their dog was going to be in a pond or stuck on a stage to be in a situation where that they were going to be put in a situation where they were going to be so completely stressed out that they were going to be to feel that they needed to bite a person in the face. Yeah, if you know me for five minutes, you know how I feel about this guy. So even professionals, right, even would-be professionals can completely misread a room. They can completely misunderstand what is happening, right? Here we had a dog that was offering calming signals and he continued to reach forward, right? And he continued to get into the dog's space, right? He continued to confront the dog as opposed to oh my God, I see that you're feeling uncomfortable. Let me back off. He needed to try to show this dog who was the boss of a situation. You're not going to win that fight. You're not going to win, right? The dog has bigger teeth. He's absolutely going to win that, right? That's not, there's no reason to try to compete with that. Um, when you're dealing with someone who is afraid, why would you, why would you want to try to show someone who's afraid that you're bigger or better than them? What's the point of that, right? Um, only that situation is happening because you don't understand what they're trying to communicate. When someone is afraid, you should have more compassion, not less. So after what you just saw, uh, when you see this video, our heart's gonna sink, but no bite occurs in this video. A vegan has Minky. I love you, Minko. Like Jada and Huggy. I like you. Okay, remember we talked about how 77% of all dog, dog bites happen when the parent, or, you know, in the family home by the family dog, and most of those occur when the parent is less than a foot away. The parent was taking the video, right? So it's not, it's not that she wasn't watching, right? It wasn't that she wasn't there. Um, did you hear what they were saying? She was saying... Um, you're, um, you're snoring. Um, I'm not going to stop snuggling you. You're snoring, right? Neither her nor the child understood what was happening, but clearly we do, right? We understand that this dog was super uncomfortable, obviously, right? Trying to pull their body away, offering that whale eye, ears are back, growling, um, trying to remove themselves from a, from a situation. Um, so much patience, right? This dog was like, oh my God, give me the heck out of this situation, please. Um, it's, it's so important that we understand it's not about teaching our dogs to tolerate an inappropriate child. Um, it, we absolutely need to teach our children not to be inappropriate with dogs, for sure. But we also need to teach our our adults to be mindful about what what should we be looking for how do we know when our dog is stressed our dogs have the right to their emotions our dogs have the right to say no our dogs have the right to say I I'm, I'm out right I need a minute I need I don't want to be underfoot when you have 15 people over for Thanksgiving I I don't I don't want to partake in this right now they have the right to do that that's that's an important thing to understand so many times we hold our dogs to a standard we don't hold any other being on the planet, right? We tell our dogs, you have to be nice to everyone. You have to let everyone touch you. You have to want to be touched by everyone. You have to say hi to everybody. Like, could you imagine that you and I could be held to the same standard? No way. So it's important to understand that the emotional state of our dogs is important. We need to know how they're feeling. We need to know that their communication is important. 
All right, let's take a look here um, about um, seeing a dog go from a happy, um, excited state to a fearful state, how quickly it can change. <sighs> so here I walk into a room, happy, except for tired carrier. How do we know he's happy? He's bouncing around, mouth is open. Front legs are bent. He's happy as can be. Right? He's nice and relaxed in his body movements. Mouth is open. And then in walks this guy. So what you might not be able to tell from this video, this is my husband. He has a big huge mask on and he's carrying an umbrella. you to notice uh, the 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 um the costume head that he has on do y'all remember a uh, night i think it's nightmare before christmas the um the jack skeleton it's like a big huge jack skeleton head and he has an umbrella to top uh, on top of it so i want you to notice first notice how the first thing that the dog do did was to remove himself from the situation right he kind of checked in a little bit and then hightailed it out of there Dogs are always going to choose to remove themselves if they can, right? Dogs are going to fight or they're going to flight. That's their, that's their choice. So if they can, they're going to want to get themselves out of a situation. So you can see that he's trying to increase the distance from something. He, his body language gets really stiff. He closes his mouth. He starts barking at the thing. This is spooky barking. Um, if you want to learn more about barking, certainly take our Barking 101 class. This happens to be spooky barking. It's monotone um, directed towards the thing that he's barking at. Um, and um, you'll see how the scary thing responds. He's just going to start to throw food at him. <laughs> There you can kind of see his jack skeleton head a little bit. So he's feeling a little bit better because he's been throwing food at him for a few minutes. But in again, he comes in again. Stiff body language. He brought in a doll this time. So here we've got another happy dog. Animated movement. Checks in and then increases his distance. Closes his mouth. There's that, that whale eye. Ears are back. Back is haunched. situation. Tail is tucked. She even defecates right there. Literally scared the poop right out of her. You notice her hackles are going up. So the reason I show this is I want you to now imagine that the dog's on leash. Now I want you to imagine that they're on an exam table or on the grooming table, right? What if the dog was feeling that level of fear and they couldn't leave? 
So thinking about that mindset, thinking about when our dogs don't have a choice, what are they likely to do? Knowing that when we put our dogs in a situation and they can't get themselves out of it, what are they likely to do? By understanding what they would do if given the opportunity, it helps us understand what they would most likely do if they couldn't, right? If these dogs were restrained, chances are they would start growling. Chances are they would snap. Chances are they would bite because they couldn't get out of a situation. So making sure that if you're starting to see those calming signals in your dog, get your dog the heck out of there. If you're, if you're able to do so, remove your dog from a situation. Your dog was never going to be better by just enduring it, right? Exposure alone is never going to help your dog. Think about something that you're afraid of. For me, it's spiders, right? I don't like spiders. They freak me out. Uh, but, it, but fear is not logical, right? I should not be afraid of a one inch spider, but I am. But could you throw a spider on me every day for a month and expect that I'm ever gonna feel different about spiders? No. So if your dog is afraid of other dogs, going to the dog park is not helpful. Stop doing it. Exposing your dog to something that you're afraid of is not helping. Exposure alone is not going to help. I will give you a plan that will help, but just exposure alone isn't going to do it. All right, so let's talk about a plan of action. What is going to work? How can you help your dog? when we're dealing with aggression and reactivity and fear. So in this video, um, this is uh, Tempest. Um, Tempest is a Humane Society dog. This, uh, this is a couple of years ago. Um, the, the Whatcom Humane Society contacted me because they had this puppy that got surrendered um, and nobody could touch her. She was about five month old cattle dog. And um, this, the, this compilation of videos was taken over um, about 21 days, I think. Um, and so this, um, we're going to see what I did and um, how it worked out for. So notice her calming signals. Notice... Um, her curved back, notice how she won't really settle, she won't really lay down. Um, notice her lunging towards me coming into the space. Notice that curved back. Her ears are forward, her mouth is closed, her brow is furrowed. Our tail is tucked, her hackles are up, she's blinking her eyes, her mouth is closed. I reach in with that assess a hand, she removes herself from a situation. What would happen if she couldn't? So now I start with just throwing food at her. I find the highest value food that I possibly can. Notice that I'm not asking anything of her. I just start throwing her food. In this case, I think I'm using, uh, the first few days I'm using uh, uh, just a, like a jerky. So she's definitely interested. You can see that she's kind of moving from side to side. She sits, she's, which tells me she's a little bit more comfortable. She 
still doesn't want to um, get close enough to me. There's that paw lift. Am I here to hurt her? day seven, I think, or day eight. This is me going to the shelter every day. This is about day 12. Hi, little baby. How are you? Who's a good girl? Are you a good girl? Is that you a good girl? So notice I was waiting for yeah. that consent. This is day 18. Are we friends? Yeah, are we friends? Oh, that's a good girl. That's a good girl. That's a good girl. Yeah. I'm asking for consent oh, here, so waiting good. for her to lean in. Oh, she's a good girl. I know. I know. Good. That's nice. It's a good girl. Oh, it's a good girl. Yes. Okay. Girl. Notice that sound that she's making the I think here we are at uh, day 20. Oh, <laughs> There's that open mouth and exposed oh, tongue. Yeah, are you a good girl? Yeah, you're a very good girl. Very good girl. And here we are outside the facility, day 22, or day 21 or 22. And this is a, a stranger treating the first person for the first day. So, um, here we had a dog that was, um, you could, couldn't, couldn't touch her at all. Um, and then within just a very short period of time, we were able to get her to a point where not only was she um, accepting me, but she was accepting strangers. How, how could we get there so quickly? What's important to understand is that I was focusing on her emotions. So many times people focus on behavior. I get it. I get that you want to change your dog's behavior. I want to change your dog's behavior too. But in order for us to change behavior, I have to change your dog's emotion. I have to change how your dog feels about a situation. I need to change how your dog feels about the other dog, how your dog feels about the stranger, how your dog feels about kids on bikes. Once I change how they feel about something, the behavior will come. Right? I can, I'll be able to get the behavior, no problem. But I have to change how they feel first. And I'm, and I'm going to do that by using something like food or toy that motivates them first. And I'm going to do that from a distance that they choose. So what that means is that for fearful dogs, we need to create a safe bubble for them, meaning that this is a cho choice for them. There is a distance that your dog can be from any trigger that they're afraid of, anything, right? I, there's a distance that I can be from a spider in which I am absolutely 100% not afraid. But that is a distance I choose. 
you don't get to choose, right? It's my fear. So I get to choose everything about it. I get to dictate everything. So your dog gets to be the one to dictate everything about it. If your dog is afraid of the mail carrier, there your dog gets to dictate the distance. That might be a football field, right? But that's where we start. And I was lucky enough with Tempest that that distance was about 15 feet because that was the distance of that kennel. I was I was lucky enough that I could that she was started to eat from that distance. But for some dogs, it might be 35 feet. The first thing is we have to start to figure out that distance. But it's emotion that changes behavior. So we have to start by changing your dog's emotion and the behavior will follow. So we first have to observe your dog's body language to understand their intent. When you have a reactive dog, meaning that your dog is reacting at something, they're either wanting that something to come closer or further away, right? Sometimes a dog um, is fearful and they want that thing to get further away. But sometimes dogs can be reactive because they're overstimulated, you know, drunken frat boys and they just are like, yeah, everybody can be with me, right? They're kind of just being crazy. Either way, reactivity is inappropriate. We don't want it to happen. So observing that body language will help you understand which one it is, right? If there's if their body language is stiff and their tail is tucked and their ears are back and their mouth is closed, okay, I know you want that thing to get further away. If your mouth is open and you are bouncing and your tail is up and you are googly, right? I know that you want that thing to get closer. I'm not going to give you either. Right? Like I'm not going to I'm not going to I'm not going to let that thing get closer if you are afraid of it and I'm not going to let it get closer if you wanted it to get closer. I'm not going to do either of those things. I'm going to keep you safe and I'm going to teach you that that behavior isn't okay um, if you wanted to get closer. That's not how you get things to get closer to you. Either way, reactivity is, isn't something we want, but it is helpful to know which one you're dealing with. Be mindful of your body and your state of mind. If you are not in a place to be able to work with your reactive dog, don't do it, right? Remember that working with a reactive dog shouldn't look like you're working with a reactive dog. If every time you are out with your dog and they react, you are too close to whatever it is. It should not look like you're working with a reactive dog. Remember that it's, um, it's important to keep your dog safe, safe distance, safe, safe body, safe mind, right? Emotion changes behavior. I don't want you to ask for anything. So if you've worked with a trainer that says, Oh, I want you to take your dog off to the side and get your dog to look at you and focus and look at me and watch me and sit. Forget it. Your dog is already overstimulated. Stop asking for stuff. We first need to work on the emotional state of your dog first before I can start expecting a behavior. So we have to do that as safe distance first. And we'll talk about the distance in a minute. Um, starting at a distance that your dog is calm and relaxed so that you know it's at the right distance because your dog can eat. Your dog can play, your dog's mouth is open, and tongue is exposed. That's how you find the distance, and that's where we start the work. That Again, that might be a football field, but that's where we start the work. We want to use the highest value reward you possibly can. That might be food, but that might be a ball. It depends on your dog. But chances are it's not going to be praise. You need something better than that right? Fear is, is pretty overwhelming. So we need it to be pretty substantial. So a dry, crunchy biscuit? No, I'm talking cheese, hot dog, rotisserie chicken, right? We need, we need to up the ante. And I want the rate that you give that reward to be like a flash. So um, think of it this way. Think about, let's say your dog's trigger um, is kids on bikes. Let's just say that. Uh, your dog sees a kid on a bike, they freak out. And we've determined that your dog's safe distance is 35 feet. Great. We're going to pay your neighbor kids at 40 feet away to start riding their bikes. Your dog is safe and comfortable. They're taking food. They're grabbing their tuggy toy. They're playing with their squeaky. You know it's a nice safe distance. When that bike is in sight, 
we are going to treat, 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 not treat, treat, treat. No, it's treat, 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 treat. When that bike is out of sight, treat, stop. So that you can help your dog understand that bike made this happen. That bike, that kid on a bike made chicken fall from the sky. We're trying to create that emotional response, right? This thing made that happen. And we're gonna stay at that distance for a really long time. We're gonna stay there for at least 10 sessions, right? That might be a couple of weeks. That might be 10 days, might be a couple of weeks. If your dog starts to show any calming signals, you are going way too fast. The whole point of this is that your dog knows 100% you've got their back. They need to know that you are their advocate. Only you are gonna be their advocate. Only you are gonna be there to stand up for them. So now you know, it's not a question of whether or not your dog is talking. It's a question of whether or not are you listening? I'm so glad that you came tonight. I'm so glad that I was able to help you understand how your dogs communicate um, through all different levels of communication.